Uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you enjoy listening to radio programs in your daily life? If so, what makes you turn on the radio? Uh, do you listen to hear music or to share other sad or happy stories or just to check the weather or traffic? Uh, for me, it's just, it's just a kind of good way to pass the time uh, on the bus on my way to school. Uh, however, I recently realized listening to radio programs could be more beneficial and fun than I thought before. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had a great chance to participate in one of the uh, popular local English radio programs, Saturday Brunch. At that time, we talked about the launch of NARO and the development of aerospace industries in Korea. Uh, likewise, uh, this program covers uh, various kinds of issues in our society every Saturday. Today's speaker is Diane Sejong Kim Brander from Korea, a host of the Saturday Brent. Uh, today, she will uh, share her ex experiences as a writer and host for this kind of local radio show. Uh, and let us know in detail how this kind of program is made. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our speaker with a big round of applause. Because for me it was a very new change and an opportunity to find about myself in a different aspect. Uh, so I think it would be a nice chance for me to share it with people like you, which is really important because I have been in that seat for many times and had great chances to uh, share indirect experiences from the people who have talked here on uh, in front here. So I think uh, it's my turn to give back to the local community. All right, so let's get started. Oh, so the term hostess with the mostess, I learned it from uh, one of the native speakers, a friend of mine, that uh, it's kind of a phrase that you use. Uh, and I think I am trying to become hostess with the mostess, meaning that try to host a show and give as much as possible. But I'm not sure if I'm fulfilling that. So let's continue and you can evaluate whether I'm doing that or not. Okay, so today I have a to-do no, not really, to talk list. So first of all, I would like to give you a brief intro about myself and also how I got involved in the radio show and also possibly about the makings of the radio program and then I will go into the details of making of the radio show itself. I will go process by process because it seems very simple but in fact there are many things involved in it. Afterwards, I will talk about a little bit of the bloopers or little mishaps happening in, during the recording or even before. Some things that are preventable, some things that was just, you know, came out of blue. And then I will talk about my personal reflection after doing the show for about 50 some, something weeks so far. All right, before I even get started, I do want to say today I'm here to talk about my personal experience as a radio show. But my talk today does not represent any views or official views of the Guangzhou Foreign Language Network or GFN or the Language Education Center of Chang'an National University. Now you might wonder why is Chang'an National University Language Education Center is related to this. It's because many times the TV programs or the radio programs you see on TV, they are uh, basically produced by outsourcing. 
So what they do is they give a contract to an outside institution or a, a producer of the program so they would get the budget and create a program, bring it back, and then they will broadcast it in the station. And Saturday brunch is one of them. So Chanan National University Language Education Center is the outsourcing uh, facility where they make the program and give it to GFN, and then GFN will air that. So that's why both are in relationship. And I actually have a contract with the LEC, not GFN. OK. All right, so you can't quote me on, oh, you said this about GFN today, and I will see you, or something of that sort. All right, introduction. I, I see many familiar faces in this room, so this might be a little bit, yes, my husband's waving at me. <laughs> this might be a little weird to introduce about me, but for those of you who have never seen me before, new here, or just want to know a little bit more about me, I will briefly introduce myself. My name is, on the radio show, Diane and Sejong Kim Brenner. I have a long story for that. Diane comes from uh, my grade 7 best friend. She saw an animation called Anne of Green Gables, also translated in Baikangwari N in Korean. Have you seen that animation? Maybe you have, yes. She saw it in grade 7. She really, really loved it. And then after vacation, summer vacation, she came back and said, I should be Anne Shirley and you should be Diana Berry because you're my best friend. So since then, my English name became Diana. And then when I started to work in kindergarten as a teacher, Kids had problem pronouncing Diana because it was long, many syllables. So I shortened it to Diane, and therefore it became my alias in English. Uh, Sejong is my given name in Korean. Kim is my family name. That's my paternal family name. My mother's family name is Ju. And I know that some people are starting to use both family names. But for me, because it's Ju, it becomes Ju Kim, which sounds a little weird in Korean. So I'm not going with that. Sejong Kim. And then Brenner is my uh, husband's family name. Yes. And when I started the radio show, uh, my mother actually suggested me, why don't you use your husband's family name as well, since it's part of your life as well. So I thought, OK, maybe I'll give it a shot. And it turned out to be pretty good. It's a very mouthful name, but it works. So that's me. And I was born and raised in Gwangju, the beautiful city of light. I'm pretty sure we have many. Uh, the Jewers around here as well, who are native or who have moved here or relocated. I am native to Gwangsangu. Any Gwangsangu here? <laughs> Yo! I'm so happy that we have Gwangsangu in the house. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, now I currently live in Bukgu with my husband near school, Jeonan National University. And uh, I have never left the city, basically. Yes. And I love my city. I'm very proud of it. I know that some people think that this part of the region is being sometimes marginalized by the you know, other regions. Uh, I personally don't feel it face-to-face uh, -face from every day because I have never left the city and lived as a, somebody who's from another region. But I love to talk to people from outside of Gwangju about Gwangju as much as I know about it. And the older I get, I do feel that I should learn more about my own city to be able to talk about it to other people. So. Yep, I love my city of Guangzhou. And I oh before that, and I do have really thick southern accent in Korean, which some people find it really interesting because I don't have much strong particular regional accent in English, so they think it's really weird. yeah. So basically, I have twang every time I speak in Korean. And I studied English language and literature for the bachelor's degree in a university called Korea National Open University in Korea. It's called Hanguk Hangtong Kungsinde. Yeah. And I graduated with a BA on English language and literature. I loved both. I really love uh, English plays and part of literature. And I wasn't really good at linguistics when I was in BA. But I decided to go on and pursue an MA degree in linguistics, mostly, I have to say, due to the influence of Dr. Shin. <laughs> but I, find out, I found out that uh, linguistics are also part of my passion, and it's really interesting. So I studied English, phonetics, and phonology in MA program in Chunnam National University for two years. I graduated with an MA in English, phonology, and phonetics. Currently, I am enrolled or completed the coursework 
So the study classes is done for the PhD, but I haven't. I am trying to get started on writing the dissertation. So I'm on the ADD, all but dissertation uh, status right now. And also, I have worked in several different places in the fields of mainly uh, teaching English as a foreign language in Korea. So I've taught, like I said, kindergarten students. I've taught preschool students. Oh, same thing. Uh, preschool, uh, elementary school students. I've taught some of the middle school students. I only taught not the specific SAT preparation sort of high school English, but I did teach a freshman jump-in program, which is a high school almost graduating, that kind of period between January and February where you do nothing but just hanging around. And then we have this uh, high school students who are waiting to graduate uh, into the program for the freshman jump-in English camp on campus for the university before they enter the university. So I've taught them. And then I am currently teaching university English conversation classes at the English department of Taiwan National University. And I have taught adults in terms of, I think, mostly free conversation tutoring. Yes. So that's my background on teaching English as a foreign language. I do have a, 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 a completed a TESOL degree in Language Education Center at Chana. That's most of my teaching background. And then I also worked as an international education administrative staff at the International Center of Jena National University. And also I worked at something called Yuhawan, maybe you've heard of it. It's a travel agency slash, uh, study abroad agency slash, uh, what else? Uh, they also do the translation business, yes. So I have worked for about um, 11 years now, yes. and that's my background going there. Uh, and I have worked as a radio show host and a writer since February of 2012. So this marks about a year at this time. And now I think that's enough of me. Now let's talk about how it all got started, right? It always starts with the phone call, isn't it? Yes, people call you and say, uh, D, are you interested in doing something, right? I'm pretty sure some of the guests who appeared on my show also got a phone call or a text message. But yeah, it all started with a phone call saying, how would you like to host a weekly radio talk show? Yes, I got a phone call. Uh, that was around January last year. And uh, at that time, I wasn't really working. I was during vacation because there's only university classes during the semester. And when I got the phone call, the first thing that came up to my mind was that, oh my god, I've been criticizing so much about the radio, I don't think I can do that, right? <laughs> Because I did listen to GFN radio beforehand, and I thought a couple of things of, you know, to change or to get better with the radio show from time to time. And I was thinking that, hmm, maybe I could do better. Well, that's a good song, by the way. <laughs> time to say goodbye. Are we supposed to finish? Not just yet. Okay, so I thought about it, and I mean, it's a big responsibility. So personally, I thought that I could not just make the decision right away. So when I got the phone call, I did say, uh, can I have some time to think about it, right? Can I sleep over it? So, oh, sleep on it, right? Not sleep over, sorry. <laughs> sleep on that idea. And then I first consulted with my husband over there and talked about, do you think I'll be able to take the responsibility? Do you think it's worth the time and effort? Do you think I can pull it? And then I also talked to my direct family, my mom and my sister, and asked them about it. And they were more or less very much encouraging and said, it's a great opportunity, you should be able to do it. And you should learn a lot from the experience, even if you screw it up. If you screw it up, they'll just not give you a new contract. So I figured, yeah, why not? Might as well start that, right? And I have actually participated in the Saturday brunch before I became a host as a guest a couple of times. So I kind of knew what kind of show it was. So that's also why I was uh, ready, I guess, to take over and become a host. Yeah, so there I am. I know, you're like, who's that girl? That's me one year ago. Yes, I had a haircut. I was trying to get my hair longer before I turned 30. Apparently I failed, so I had to chop it off. I didn't like it very much. But, so, I'm sorry, the fonts are really small right now, but I will just briefly tell you. So, this is our web tab in GFN. So, the program is called, called Saturday Brunch. It does not mean we eat brunch in the studio, of course not. But, we have the brunch hour, so it's from 10 until 11. 
Uh, we have a producer, actually two producers. Like I said, it's an outsourced program. So we have one producer from the LEC, Language Education Center, and one producer who actually makes the program and record in GFN, uh, meet Young Pekin, or producer Kim. And then I am the host and also the writer. So I write my own show and I also read the script and go on with the show. And the show is basically about, I will read this out loud so you can hear it, to help you understand more about Korean and international lifestyles, as well as the hottest topic at home and abroad. Not only is my invitation to brunch always open, but I will also always try to give you both new insights and helpful practical information. Am I doing that? I hope so. <laughs> yes, so that's basically <laughs> what I do. And yeah, so that's how it all got started. Then they changed the website, so I, my picture was there. And then I started to feel the responsibility even more that I should put my best foot forward for that. So now I can talk about how to make the radio show, right? So there's about five different steps. It's kind of colorful, so you can't see it very well. But we first start with the topic selection. Saturday brunch is about 55 minute long talk show. So we actually need, have, need something to talk about for that day. So we go topic by topic every week. And when we select topic, it's usually me and the producers get together and we just freely uh, brainstorm about current issues or categories of issues that we can talk about. And then we come up with a topic. Or what happens is that if there's a very special guest we can invite who would like to talk about a specific topic that he or she knows as an expert, then we would love to have that person in and have topics surround the guest instead of select a topic and then bring the guest in. So those two can be basically freely interchangeable. And then we do guest casting. Sometimes guest casting can be really difficult because of... So basically we have a topic, right? So we need somebody who knows about the topic and who can talk about the topic or who at least have some kind of relation to the topic. And also that person should be able to talk in English because it's a bunch of foreign language uh, method, right? So to have that two <coughs> factors meet and to have that limited pool of people and pick people out, it can be a little bit troublesome from time to time. So that's the difficult part. But we try our best to connect people from here and there. And I will tell you about a little bit more on how I do most of the casting a little bit later. And then we do script writing. And because I'm the writer, I am responsible for this. So I should type, 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 and write, write, write. But sometimes, you know how you know you should write this report for your class or your, for work, but it just wouldn't start, right? It takes some time for you to warm up and start, and then you just write along, and then you finish it for, what, 20, 30 minutes, and you're done. So that happens, and I feel the pain of creating new things out of nothing, but it's fun. And then we go to the studio and record, and that's actually a fairly very simple and straightforward process. Then there's broadcasting, which I don't have anything to do, but the station will do that. And then I do monitor my show. I listen to my show and see where I went wrong or see things that sound odd or weird. Yes. And also other people monitor my show and they submit the monitor results as well. Okay. Moving on. Am I talking too fast? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. I tend to do that sometimes when I get excited. Okay, so like I said, guests, choosing guests and choosing topics are basically very equal and very important process in our show because it's a talk show, right? So I would say they are just, you know, always equally similar. It's really equally balanced. So for example, let's say I have a very specific professor who could talk about the climate change and the relationship of climate change and in terms of a business administrative idea. So that kind of relationship, you cannot get a speaker who could talk about that specific topic too often, right? So when you get a chance that there is a professor who is ready to talk about it, you should get it, right? So we work around our schedule as much as possible to have him in the studio to suit his schedule. So when are you available? And then we talk to the studio. Because we have about three recording studios, but there are many programs that are being made in GFN, so we share the studio. So studio schedule is set 
So in the blank parts of the studio schedule, we need to fit ourselves in and record. So that's why we try to suit or work around as much as possible for the guest, if the guest has that expert knowledge or very specialty. For example, this week or last week, we had a Spanish student involved in one of the uh, China National University's short-term winter program. He's a Spanish student who studies in Japan who came to Korea for an exchange student program, which is really interesting. And he had a lot of uh, stay abroad pro, uh, experience, and he also worked as a translator professionally. So it's a great chance for me to have him in the radio and other people who also have maybe very similar experience like living abroad or translation experience and talk about it as a one topic. So we decided to do the recording not like usual Friday morning, but instead of move it to Monday morning. So things like that happen. Or we can set up just a topic and find people who can talk about it as much as possible too. Yeah, so I will talk a little bit more about the guests. Yeah, what things do I look for from a guest? It's very important. I know that the picture is really difficult to see because they're in the bottom, but here, uh, these are the kids. They were uh, 12 year olds actually at the time. Yeah, very young and cute. And they talk really well too in English. I think they were the winners of junior translator competition or something of that sort, some kind of English competition that GFN had. And we actually talk about the five day work week in the viewpoint of elementary school students. Yes, so it was quite an interesting topic. They talked about how their parents would spend more time with them, or how they had more time to go to Hagwons and things like that. So it was interesting to see their perspective. Uh, on the left picture here, I know it's difficult to see him because his skin is so dark. He is from Uganda, and he's from America, he's Korean, and we were talking about learning Korean language. Mm. So uh, he was a teacher, Korean language teacher. He was a student and he was also a student. So we talked about learning Korean language and what kind of difficulties there are and how it's becoming popular. So things like that kind of group the guests. So usually at one term we have two or three, mostly three people as a guest, unless we have a special program called Learn Series where we have professors coming in and share their expert knowledge. and. Well, one of the key aspects of becoming a professor, personally, no offense on any professors in the house, is that you talk a lot. <laughs> and you can talk a lot, right? Yeah. So you don't really need extra person to talk together when we have a professor as a guest, because they have so much to share and so much to talk about. Do you agree? Of course. <laughs> you talk a lot too? Uh, I don't, but... Uh, you don't? If it forces me to do, I do. <laughs> okay, yes. So he thinks he doesn't talk a lot. I don't think so. Anyway, yeah, so that's what we do. So definitely, uh, definitely we need an expertise or relevancy in the topic. But when I say expertise, people might think, oh, I'm not really expert of anything. But if you think really carefully about it, you can be expert of certain things that you like to do or you are good at doing, right? For example, if you are very uh, interested in playing, let's say, online games, that could be a good topic that you're good at, right? If you play, I don't know, League of Legends or Sun Attack or whatever it is, we can talk about that. Yes, so you are an expert there. Or we also had a topic called City Farmers. It's becoming more uh, common to do home gardening in Korea as well, even in the apartments, right? In the balcony area, little pots and things like that. So we had actually city farmers talking about their city farming experience who had nothing similar in their background but city farming itself. So that's how we group people. Yeah, and this is a particularly difficult part. I do try to balance the gender and age group and nationality as much as possible. We do like to have the diversity as much as possible. But because people involved in making the program are all females, I'm female, the producers are also female, we sometimes end up having just, you know, ladies locker room. <laughs> From time to time we have just all, all four ladies just talking about little chit chitter chatter thing. So I do try to control that, but I realized after one year, it's just impossible. As you can see here, all three guests are men, male, right? Yeah. It's not something that you can control anymore. So we just go play it by ear as much as possible these days. Uh, but in terms of age group, we do try to mix up different uh, age groups as much as possible, and also nationality. 
Also, this is kind of a key aspect of English radio, of course, right? You do need an ability to express thoughts in English. Yes.、Uh, by express thoughts, I do not mean to say that you should have a native like proficiency in English. It just means that you should be able to talk what you want to talk about, even with、uh, if, with the help of prepared script. You can read your script. I will give you the questions in advance. You will write that down and just read it because it's a radio. Nobody sees you reading the script, right? <laughs> so you can just read it. That's perfectly fine, as long as you don't stutter, right? Yes. Anyway, so your ability to express thoughts in English is important, but not as important that your pronunciation matters or the contents matter. Actually, so contents are important, and also I do have to say. Another important thing is to have that kind of confidence to overcome your、uh, nervousness, right? In the studio is important. And、uh, what else? Listeners who listen to my show, actually, there are more native speaker listeners, surprisingly, than the、uh, non-native speaker listeners, according to the monitor of the show. But at the same time, native listeners who listen to、uh, GFN do recognize that I have Korean guests or. Guess whose、uh, whose English is not their first language, right? So they do understand that this is not their first language, and they will be able to understand it with the basis that this is not their first language. So you don't have to be stressed about being grammatically wrong in your expressions. The important part is the contents, usually. Yes, and this is this is most important part: willingness to participate. As much as I think this person is a perfect guest to appear on the radio, if this person is not willing to participate, but I have to butter him up or anything like that, and ask this person to come out, it usually ends up as not, not a disaster, but not a really good outcome. Usually, it's it involves people really want to participate, who will do much better than people who have the ability but don't want to participate. And we had a couple of cases where we asked. The person who we think is adequate to come and participate in the show, but got no. So I'm getting more used to getting re- rejections for the invitations. But I did learn through the process that willingness to participate can overcome the lack of maybe the language ability or generally lack of language ability. Yes. Okay. And previous experiences. Yes, we do have recurring guests. Guests who have come and enjoyed the process, and also who had good time, and who have proven us that they are very much prepared for this kind of a program participation, we always contact them back and have them for another episode. Yes, and of course they do much better than the ones who are the, the first timers. So previous experiences on the radio show like mine. Or people who have done short radio segments in other programs are also very much preferred. Now, these are the the cute little button and flags that I collected of the people who were in my show for the last one year of their nationality, and I'm going to try to remember all of their、uh, country names. So this is like geography for me.、Uh, Croatia. We had a Croatian student, exchange student. I couldn't even remember her.、Uh, we talked about energy drinks, and she said it's interesting how Korean students are more interested in having energy drinks to stay up all night, not to party, but to study for exams. <laughs> she thought that it was a culturally very big difference, right? And then that's Thailand.、Uh, yes, we had a graduate student, an MBA graduate student, exchange student from Thailand, who talked about MTs and OTs. You know what that is, right? Yeah, orientation,、uh, things like that. Apparently, they have the exact same thing in Thailand too, and that peer pressure. Russian. Yes, we had Mila in the studio, and we did try to get Mila's mom, but we didn't.、Uh, Malaysia. Yes, it's Malaysia. We had several Malaysian exchange students coming into the studio talking about K-pop and the K-wave in Malaysia. Apparently, Korean cosmetics and also <coughs> Korean、uh, instant ramen is popular in Malaysia. Surprisingly,、uh, Denmark. There was one person from Denmark.、Uh, Vietnam. We had several Vietnamese. China. Korea, of course. We had many, many.、Uh, one Japanese student. Many Americans. Australia, Canada, Germany. We actually had one student who's from Germany who talked about half of tuition. 
you know the half off tuition movement last year? It was really big. So it was in, I think, April last year. We talked about half off tuition movement. And I recently updated uh, the news that Germany, finally, like the two last states, decided to give up on charging students for tuition. So it's absolutely free to study in Germany in terms of tuition. Of course, the boarding will cost and the cost of living still cost. But at that time, we were talking about what kind of supports German students have, what kind of system they have for the tuition. And we compared and discussed a little bit about our situation here in Korea. Yeah. And we also had some people from Philippines. Yes. And then one student uh, was from Uganda. Uganda? Yeah. And it was really nice to talk about all these people who are 129 people over the course of the year from 15 different countries. So, yeah, I do think that we were pretty good with the diversity within the realm of Guangzhou. They were mostly from Guangzhou. I had one people from Washington State in America who visited for a very short term for Yosu Expo. So they were the true visitors, travelers. So it was really nice to see their point of view on Yosu Expo instead of people who stayed here for a long time. So things like that. All right, topics. I will go briefly. Oh yeah, this is really small font for you, so it's going to be difficult. So uh, we usually go for a long-term plan for about four, uh, three months worth ahead. So October, November, December, we have all these about 12 weeks lined up. As I said, it's a weekly plan. So we talk about the topics, and we then, then decide on topics and the dates of recording and broadcasting. Because we record before uh, broadcasting, so we try to set up the date. As you can see, we have different categories like cultural, special topics, political, social, cultural. We try to rotate those topics as much as possible, even though sometimes we overlap, of course. Yes. And then I do come up with some of the possible list of people who can appear, but this does not always go with the plan, of course. People have things to do. Yep. And then I need to go and start writing the script. But before I do the script writing, I try to collect relevant information from the internet. Usually I do uh, collect some of the uh, internet news articles, not only from Korean sources, but international news journals. And also I go for the references like Wikipedia, which many people go to. Uh, I do collect like uh, personal information from people around me, what they think about the specific topic. And then I do organize the thoughts before uh, writing the opening comment. So. Uh, we just heard Yeonjin talking about how she made up this opening comment for me, right? That's the part that I write for my own show and talk about the topic. And that's the most painful part. Because I need to write, write, and write. Which sometimes is just, you know, I don't have that inspiration to write, so it takes forever. And I usually like to write at night, which is bad, probably. But I have much more productivity at the time. And then... I cannot just use the script that I wrote because I am not the native speaker of English, right? So I do get it proofread and edited by my beloved husband, who is doing it for free. Thank you! <laughs> Yay! And I will make you a nice dinner. From yes. And then I revise it and then send it to the producer so that the guests can take a look at it and then write the answers for the questions. Yes. And I try to send it as uh, at least... 48 hours before the broadcast or uh, recording because that way we can give time for people to write down their answers in case they get nervous, they can read it. So this is an example of a script. And this is the part that gives me the most headache. It is so hard to come up with a nice opening comment. This one I wrote for an uh, episode for Hansi. I will read it for you because you can't really see it very well. Succulent beef primaries marinated in rich flavorful sauce of pepper, garlic, sesame oil, honey, brown onions, finely chopped green onions, soy sauce, and fresh pureed Asian hair bar barbecued over sizzling grill on your very own table. Sounds tempting? Yeah, so things like that, right? So I do need to think really hard and come up with the right word or adjective for that. For example, because English is not my first language, I would question why should I use pureed pears instead of ground pear? Why can't I ground pear, right? For Korean, we can say 가른 pear, right? 대지 가른 pear. So I would say ground pear, right? But why is it pureed? I don't know, but that's the way it is in 
I think native context, even native speaker context. So that kind of part, my husband gets in and then help out with uh, better expressions for specific context. I think. Yes. So that gives me headache most of the time. And then we get to recording part. First, we do a microphone test for not just me, but all the other three guests. We talk, and sometimes during the microphone test, uh, people have different posture during the microphone test, and in the real recording, people move around, and that's a no-no because the microphone in the studio are very specific. They have a have some kind of a directionality, so if you move around, it sounds very different. So in the studio, it's better for you to just stay in one exact posture as much as possible, which feels very uncomfortable for the first time. And, uh, and then we do recording part by part, so there are minutes that you need to make sure to go by. And I am in charge of that. So I look at the clock while people are talking, and I try to make sure to meet the timeline between part A, part B, part C, and part D. Sometimes it doesn't work as the way you want it to be, but I try very hard to make sure that the ends meet. And then, so that's what I do, time check. Yes, as you can see, when we're on air, there's a clock. And from the outside, producer writes down the time. Talk till something something. And then I make sure to finish art around that time as much as possible. And apparently my pro producer and engineer did uh, compliment me, saying that you're pretty good at that. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> and there are do's and don'ts in the studio when you're recording. Do look at your host, me, when she's talking. So in the studio, we're talking as a talk show style. But when I'm talking, it normally means I am going to ask questions to one of the guests. But you don't know who I will ask, right? So when I'm reading, you should look at me as a guest. And then I will do the hand signal. You're next, you're next, and you're next. So when I'm reading, you need to look at me. Mm. Do drink water or hit the rest, hit the restroom before the recording starts. Yes, it's much better to do that before the recording instead of in the middle of the recording you feel very hoarse and <clears throat> things like that. Or you say, uh, can I go to the loop? Things like that. Uh, and turning off your cell phones is important. I do tell people, please turn off your cell phone or turn it into airplane mode or keep it outside of the recording studio. And there was one time that I forgot to say that. That one time I forgot to tell our guests, leave your cell phone out. And then one time, the cell phone rang during the recording. <laughs> it's always that one time, right? Yeah, so afterwards I always tell people, you can leave it outside or turn it off inside. Things not to do in the studio. Don't make unnecessary noise while you're on air. When you're recording, it's important not to make any kind of noise, including this. You think this is not a big noise, right? But in the studio, it's soundproof room, so the paper flipping sound is very, very noisy, more or less. So when you see on the news, 9 o'clock news, you see after the news is finished and when the announcer says, have a good evening, right? And then they bow, and there's the bum, 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 the sound, right? The signal sound. And do you see that people always do this, right? They put their scripts backwards. That's because they don't have their script with the, with the what's it called, statement, right? It's not like that. Because this makes more sound than this. Mm, so that's what we do in the studio. And don't be nervous or fresh when you're asked a follow-up question. So sometimes I ask guest questions that are not written in the script. And then people get a little nervous or they, they get, oh, I don't know what to say, right? You can just say, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> it's okay to say that. It's okay to say that you don't know about it or you haven't thought about it. But it's not okay to not say anything. If there's a mute moment, that's a no-no for the radio show. So it's better to say something, even if you can't remember anything. You will say, um, you know, and then I will just catch that and move on with the comments. So that's entirely possible. And then, yes, I should monitor, yes. Sometimes I get really lazy and sleepy on Saturday morning, so I miss my own show, I will confess that, yes, I do sleep it from time to time. But monitoring is very important because, first of all, it does help me to reflect my own performance. You get to hear all the mistakes I made. The first show I have ever monitored of my own, I realized that I always say, yes, I agree to all the statements that my guests made. 
I was like, I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you, like 10 times in that 50 minute show, which is, I don't think it's a good idea. So after that, I wrote a number of different expressions that means the same thing, and tried to intentionally use different kinds of expression that also means I agree. Also, it gives me ideas on how to improve next time, not only myself, but also even for the guests. If I tell the guests to maybe use news articles that I send you as a reference to uh, empower your answers or enhance your answers, people will do that. But if I don't explain that, people will not be able to do <coughs> that, and we will have a show with uh, less richer context in there, right? So usually, I think it gives me an idea on how to do better, not for myself, but also for the guests next time. And then, of course, I get to learn how others think about the show. For example, we have the official monitoring people for the GFN, and we get the weekly monitoring. And I heard it through my producer about a couple of comments. For example, I talk fast. When I get excited, I talk fast, and people who are nervous will talk faster, too. So we have a guest who's nervous, and I ha they have me who's talking fast. So together, we're talking really, really, really fast. And then the listeners will have a hard time or not feel comfortable listening to the show, especially because it's a talk show. Also, another comment was, I think, well, it was a better comment, I think, that the comments were good. And sometimes, you know, comments from the listeners come straight from your own family. My brother-in-law, who is in America, he listens to my show more often than any of my other members of the family, which I really do appreciate. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, and he listens to it online because Eastern Time, it's, uh, it's broadcast on Saturday morning here, but Eastern Time, it's, uh, it's 10 p.m. in the afternoon or in the evening or something like that that on Friday night. So on Friday night, he comes home and he listens to my radio show, which I really, really appreciate. And then he talked to me about some of the shows that he enjoyed. For example, one time we talked about single uh, person household increasing in Korea, people who are living by themselves, right? And then Stephen told me, yeah, I totally agree with that subject and was interesting to hear about because he himself is also a single uh, bachelor who is living in his own house and making a living at the same time. So there was much... Uh, I guess, fear of understanding between them. So it was really nice to hear about that and have a listener abroad. So, yeah. Monitoring is important. But of course, when you're doing the radio show, we do come across some of the problems. Sorry, it's on the bottom. It says, Houston, we have a problem. Do you remember that? Yes. Houston, we do have a problem when people say, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, on my show. Because we're recording in the afternoon or in the morning, but it's a morning show, right? And we're recording in advance. So when people say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or any kind of reference to weather, is a no-no, right? Because we don't know what kind of weather we will have on the day of broadcast, right? Don't say anything about the weather. Or one time we were talking about energy drinks consumption among Korean students, and we wanted to air that around the time of midterm for universities, right? But we were recording before midterm, so I was talking about, hey, how did your midterm go? <laughs> and yes, we're lying, right, of course. Yeah, it did well, it went well, I think. Yeah, things like that. So we do try to be careful. Also, sometimes topics can be time uh, sensitive. For example, last year in March, there was, I don't know if you remember, Match fixing in baseball. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. In baseball, Korean baseball league. So we wanted to talk about that, but the uh, investigation was on the process when we were <coughs> recording. So we were not sure how the investigation would progress when we were airing it, right? So that's kind of a time-sensitive uh, topic that we shouldn't probably talk about on the radio, especially like ours, which is not a live show. Ah, Samsung, LG, and what else? This is about talking about the company names, or TV show names, basically names on the radio. You can say these names if it's in something like you are laying out different kinds of brand. But if you're saying, oh, the Samsung cell phone is the best in the world, or oh, but I like iPhone better, that's not a, that's a no-no on the radio show. You cannot particularly promote a specific brand name or specific uh, product or station and things like that. And uh, we have 
not many people did this, but usually we just go with the one cue, basically. When we start recording, we just go all the way to 55 minute period. But we had a couple of people who were very nervous about themselves, who were very self-conscious about record recording, and then they said, uh, can we do it again? Uh, can we do it again? <laughs> As in multiple times, oh, can we stop and redo it? That's okay, we can do that, but we normally what we do is we just record all the way through. So if you have tongue twisted or tongue tied, and then you just start over, continuing, you don't stop. And then later, the engineer will edit them, right? Cut and paste and things like that. But normally we just, just go on, because we do make mistakes and not really, most of the mistakes are so terrible that, that cannot be aired. Usually, if you say, let's say, swear word, yes, we will chop that off, right? That's a problem. But usually, like a stutter or tongue twist, people, tongue tie, people understand that it's a little bit of a mistake. So you don't have to go 10 times again and try to be the perfectionist. Ah, and then, yes, that one I already talked about, told you about the cell phone, right? That one time I did not tell people to turn off the cell phone, it rang. Great. Ah, and this last one is usually my problem. Uh, when I have guests who I know in person, who can, who, uh, who I think is this much in the profession, proficiency level of English, let's say, if this person is not a native speaker of English, then when they come to the studio, and if they perform less than what I know about them, I feel like, oh, I know you can do better than this, come on, come on. Inside, I feel more nervous when I know this guest. But if I don't know this person and have no expectation or don't know what kind of level of English or personal opinions she or she can portray, then I go, ooh, you're really good. So I think my personal expectations sometimes become a problem in the show because I know what this person can do, but he or she is not delivering as much as I think that he or she can do. So that can be sometimes a problem. And then let's move on. Is this okay time with? This is okay? Okay. Alright, and then this is probably the last part before Q&A. Uh, Self-reflection. What I have learned over one year of doing this show, I learned to, I think, better interact with people. Yes. In terms of getting the guests, or in terms of contacting the people to get more guests. Uh, in terms of interacting people with people in the studio and outside of the studio, I think I got to do a little bit better than before. And yes, I learned to lead a professional conversations because my show is a talk show. And I learned to hold balanced viewpoint on current issues instead of being very much one-sided or the other-sided. Because I'm a host, I should not have much strong opinion on certain issues. Except I did have a very strong opinion on one issue where it was about the uh, uh, adequate penalties for uh, violent sex offenders. Yes, because you know how it became a big issue last year in the later part of the year because of the series of rape uh, cases which was submerged, uh, surfaced on the news every day. It, it's not that it did not happen, but it, the issue rises above, so we decided to talk about that. And I did have very strong opinion on that, personally. Which is not a good thing, but I did. And appreciate wonderful people around me. My family who monitor, uh, my husband who proofreads and edit the script. Thank you very much again. And also all the people around me who are willing and able to uh, support me by introducing <coughs> people who might be interested in doing the radio show. I cannot do this without them. I cannot do this alone. And I learned more that you cannot live by yourself. Yes, it's, it's a small world. And I think that I get to appreciate more of these people around me who are inspiring me and affecting me in a, in a very good way. And I think I gained a deeper understanding of who I am and what I am uh, capable of. What I can do and what I cannot do. I think I've become more clear about that. And also what kind of person I am when I am portrayed on the media, I think, is what I learned. Okay, so is this the right time to do the Q&A or collect the Q&A? Yes, okay. I can't answer your questions. So, um, 
This, now is the time for the Q&A portion of the talk. Uh, if you didn't receive a piece of paper when you came in, please raise your hand. One of our volunteers will give you a piece of paper. Uh, please don't uh, ask questions directly. Write your questions on the paper. Hand them to one of our volunteers, and I will ask the speaker the questions. So, um, ben, thank you again for your uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we'd like to start off with a few questions uh, about you personally. So you uh, talked about your uh, MA in English Phonology and Phonetics, correct? Yes. Uh, are there any interesting things about English Phonology and Phonetics that you learned during your studies? During my studies? Yeah, any particularly interesting things? Particularly interesting things? Well, my MA dissertation was about devoicing of English Z or Z, which I think is very specific. Actually, phonetics and phonology tend to be a very specific area of study. And what I did was uh, think about the word, English word like bus and buzz, B U Z Z, right? Yes, bus and buzz. Uh, you think that two are different because bus is S and buzz is Z, right? But the thing is that in real conversation, Z and buzz become very much divorced. It almost sounds like bus. Right? Then how do people tell the difference between buzz and bus was what I studied. And I realized that there is a, a somewhat of a hyper-correction for higher level speakers of English. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So Korean speakers who, who, can do, who do a, a good, I guess, higher proficiency score actually pronounce Z more strongly with Z sound at the end, even though it's more natural to not say it as a Z, but devoice it into Z in a real life conversation, like a native speaker. So apparently, I think it was because for a higher level speaker, we understand that Z and S has a difference between voicing and devoicing, so they wanted to show that because they know it. Whereas for the lower level students, uh, they actually did it uh, more naturally between devoicing and devoicing. Sorry, I can't explain it very well, but it's a very specific field, so if you want to talk about it a little bit more, maybe we can talk after the Q&A session. Yeah. So is this what you're continuing on for your dissertation topic, or something similar? Something similar within the field of phonology and phonetics, but I, I haven't decided on that yet. Okay. I should. <laughs> and one last uh, uh, thing about you. Personally, you mentioned you have a strong Jala accent. Oh, yes. Is there something you can give us for the non-Korean speakers? Can you give us an example of something you say that's very dialect versus how uh, the more standard Korean Really? Language? I can only currently think of this one expression that many, my, many of my friends asked when I was little, what does it mean? And I still cannot tell you what it means. <laughs> it's just, uh, you just say it naturally. Wume. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Ume. Ume. <laughs> Where my area it is. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I guess also about you personally, but as it relates to your show, your radio show, we have lots of people asking, how is your English so good? Only childhood education pays off sometimes, okay. <laughs> I think. Okay. So, you don't have any secrets that you can share about how to sound like a native speaker? The thing is though, I think uh, we get less opportunity to talk in English, or actually use your English after learning it from the book. So coming to GIC like here and talk with people around here, both Korean, international people, whomever it is, to find a person to talk to whatever topic that you're interested in, in English, I think is important. And that's one of the ways I learned English, actually, after being an adult speaker. Before being an adult, I think I usually went for the Hagwon uh, environment. But after you are hitting that certain stage where learning stuff from Hagwon kind of is important, of course, but kind of has meets that kind of rooftop where you're learning something but not as much as you want to or not as much as you think will be important in the real life conversation. You should just be out there, find a person who can talk to you, uh, who you can talk to about a topic that you're interested in. Talk about your, your favorite games, talk about your favorite application, talk about your favorite TV shows in English. And I think that's definitely uh, one way to do it. Okay, so moving on to your show specifically, could you share with us maybe your best or most memorable radio moment? 
or do you have a favorite topic that you've covered? My favorite topic that I've covered, I actually like most of the topics that we covered. <laughs> so it's really difficult to find one topic that I really like the most. Uh, but I think recently, actually, we had two <coughs> interns from GIC. Uh, they're actually right here, and I'm going to embarrass them by calling their names. <laughs> but they're over there. And Yuni, are you in the crowd? No, Yuni's not here. Yeah, Yuni and uh, Unja who is doing the internship here for the new starting. This is your second month? Is that right? Yes, so this is their second month. And they were talking about uh, doing an internship, what they're doing right now. So basically a job search was the topic, so it was directly related to their current situation. And we talked so much in depth that I think I was amazed by the uh, amount of information they brought in for the studio. And they were so much prepared and very professional. So I think I remember that episode being very much like, it was just on. It was right on. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so is, what's the most incredible or surprising thing you've learned from a guest? From a guest, oh, surprising. I don't think I was surprised per se. But I did learn a very interesting, I guess this is a subculture. I had uh, one episode where we talked about dating cultures around the world, right? And we had one guest who was an exchange student from Canada, but she was born in Vietnam and then migrated, immigrated to Canada. So she was basically a Canadian Vietnamese. So she had both cultures in her. So she had the Vietnamese family culture where uh, men are expected to pay for their dates. But her sister was dating in Canada and she was dating a Canadian and she expected him to pay for the date. And apparently it did not happen. So she thought, and she talked to this person who was the guest on the radio, to her sister saying that, oh my God, I think he hates me because he didn't pay for the date. <laughs> so even within that kind of like small culture differences within Canada, of all things, uh, it was interesting for me to hear about the different viewpoints on very specific topics. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about your guests. Mm -hmm. um, other than maybe not feeling confident in their language ability, why might someone reject an invitation to be on your show? Uh, I definitely think one of the reasons why people would reject to be on the show is the same reason that I had to take time to consider about being on the show. I think they were uh, sometimes afraid of the criticism that they might get for being on the radio because once it's aired, you cannot return it, right? Turn it back, and what you say on the radio might get you, <laughs> I guess. And that's probably one of the reasons why people refuse to do it. Lack of time or lack of energy to put into preparing for a show, I guess, uh, was maybe one of the reasons. Maybe they had really busy schedule, or maybe they just don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had someone come on to your show where the language ability was a problem, where they just couldn't make themselves understood? And do you have guests that really prepare almost a script themselves before they come on? Well, most of the non-native speakers who come to my show do come with a 100% prepared script. Okay. Yes, and they read it, which is perfectly fine, because we time it very well, and it sounds more natural than you think it is, and you can see them reading it. Uh, but we did have a couple of guests who did prepare their scripts and still had difficult time reading it because of that environment of recording studio, right? They were very tense and nervous, so just reading itself was very nerve-wracking. They were a little bit shaky, and I could tell. So in that case, I do try to throw a couple of jokes so that people can laugh, and then they get a little bit loosey-goosey, and they get to talk a little bit better. But I do help out when people cannot make the full sentence, and they just throw the words, and then I rephrase it, and then paraphrase it, and then we go on with the show. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that sounds like something you do well on your show. What do you think you do best on your show? What part of doing your show do you do the best? Me, as a, as a, as a, as a host? Yes. I try, I guess. I do try to make people feel comfortable. <laughs> I'm not sure 100% if people feel comfortable in my show, but I think I try to smile a lot. I try to make them feel comfortable by throwing some easy questions in the part two where they start to talk. And according to my producer, she says, I have 
less uh, awkward uh, language habits that sounds uh, that can be a little bit um, agitating for the listeners. For example, some people have the language habits such as uh, doing uh huh uh huh all, all the time when other people are talking, or doing you know or. What I'm saying is, or how do I say this? Things like that are fillers, right? But if you use fillers too often, that's a problem. And my producer will tell me, but she said that I am pretty good with not doing that. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, some people don't want to be on the radio or uh, want to hear themselves later is people don't like the sound of their own yeah, voice. I don't, I don't do, so, uh, <laughs> do you like the sound of your own voice? <laughs> it sounds like no. Well, uh, well, I. Based on my background in phonology and phonetics, the reason why your voice sounds different on the radio than what you hear yourself is because your articulatory organs are so close to your auditory organs. Do you understand what I mean? So your speech-making organs are very close to your hearing organs. So that's why it sounds different. But the actual sound being made from your articulatory organ that travels through the airwaves to other people's ear is different. For example, I did not know that I had such high-pitched voice <laughs> until I hear myself. <laughs> yes, and uh, usually for I think women, it's higher pitched than what you think your own voice is. So that's very odd to hear yourself. But because I should monitor myself, so I do wear the headphone when I'm uh, recording. But the guests, I ask them not to wear it because it's really weird to hear yourself, right? So they don't have to wear it. So in my show, at least, they don't have to wear the headphones. So just a few more questions mm -hmm. before we wrap up. Um, first, would you talk about your future career? What are your plans after you finish your dissertation? Uh, <laughs> I will take jobs that are being offered. <laughs> Whatever job that is being offered, but based on my uh, degree, I will take. But I think uh, we do want to consider both of our situation, apply for a job, and see, uh, like for example, let's say he's number one and number two uh, job offers, and my number one and number two and number three job offers. Among them, there's maybe one and three overlap, or three and one overlap between the two. We will probably do some kind of compromise or talk about it discuss about it, and then decide where to move on, right? What's that? Thank you, swear. Sure. <laughs> but you are looking to do academia after you finish your dissertation? Uh, I, yeah, I think so. Okay. I hope that academia accepts me, but if they don't, I think uh, we'll, we'll consider doing a food truck. <laughs> smash burgers, uh, no, smash potatoes and what? Lamb burgers and smashed potatoes. Yes, yes. We will do a food truck if, every, if things don't turn or work out very well. <laughs> Got a plan B. That's good. So this is this next question will be the final question for today's Q and A session. Um, if we didn't, there were a lot of questions. If you, we didn't get a chance to answer your question, please feel free to talk to the speaker directly after the talk. And also remember, we will have a discussion section following the talk. And that's another opportunity to ask questions to the speaker. So finally, um, can you tell us, are there any topics that you're really interested in that you haven't been able to talk about on your show yet, and do you have plans to do that? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. I have a couple of topics that are on my mind. For now, I think last year, uh, around May, we did cover extensively and intensively May 18th uprising. But I think this year, during the, the month of May, at least one time, we would like to talk about human rights in general, human rights issues in general, women's human rights and uh, uh, refugee situation. Uh, I realized that uh, Korea is one of the countries, uh, what we actually got a warning from, uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the organization, but we got a warning from an international organization for uh, refusing to accept refugees, political refugees, because we had one of the lowest, lowest acceptance of uh, political refugees from other countries around the world. So yes, human rights issue, I definitely want to uh, cover it at least one time this year, especially during the month of May. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you again for your answering our questions, and uh, let's give her another round of applause.